So uh, this is part two of um, Intro to Liberal History. Uh, we're going from the Civil War in 1862 to um, uh, Louisville in 1923. So on the left is the Civil War, and on the right is uh, 1923 skyline of Louisville. And again, this is more of a general history, not a uh, in-depth view of every uh, detail of history of Louisville. And uh, part one that we had last time, we went from how the uh, geology of the region was formed with glaciers and uh, uh, the falls of the Ohio and the geology and all that. Then we went into indigenous people, then the Europeans coming in, uh, building forts, Thomas Jefferson and uh, uh, Northwest Expedition and county name for Thomas Jefferson, the forts and all that house. Louisville started to be developed, um, uh, Portland Canal, Cave Hill Cemetery, Zachary Taylor, and then all the way down to the uh, Civil War start. So we, we covered a lot of uh, history in part one, all the way from the very beginning up to 1861. So today we're going to pick up in 1862 and talk about the Battle of Perryville, October 7th and 8th of 1862. That was what, 161 years ago, if I'm doing my math right? Very long time ago. Um, and uh, basically, Perryville was our Gettysburg. Everyone's familiar with Gettysburg, with the Confederates going north and the Union coming south. Same thing happened here in Kentucky with uh, the Confederates coming up from Tennessee, and then all the Union troops based in Louisville coming south, and they all converged right there in Perryville which is just south of Danville, Kentucky. Not which sure. is where I live. Oh, there you go. Yeah, Danville. Has anyone ever been to uh, Perryville? Or, yeah, know? been to the battlefield. Yeah, so uh, uh, and we're showing some. I've been down to the reenactment at least mm -hmm. once, maybe twice. It's, it's really something to see all that uh, being reenacted. And a lot of the um, soldiers that were injured in the Battle of Perryville were brought up to Louisville at the hospitals here. And then a lot of them succumbed due to their injuries, and they were buried at Cave Hill Cemetery. If you ever go to Cave Hill Cemetery and read a lot of the uh, tombstones there, the headstones, they say October 1862, because a lot of them were injured at the Battle of Perryville and brought north. There's also a, a Confederate section, burial section there in Cave Hill. Over 200 Confederates are buried there, and, uh, and, all, and they were more than likely prisoners. They were brought up through the l and Railroad, um, imprisoned at the uh, prison there at the 10th and Broadway, and subsequently died of illnesses or at the end of a rope, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So anyways, Battle of Perryville, very uh, dramatic episode in uh, Kentucky hi history. Um, Louisville was surrounded by earthen forts. They weren't so much wood forts like you traditionally would see, but they mounted up earth and made these huge mounds of our berms, and they had a number of these, like seven or eight of these earthen forts around the perimeter of the city to protect it from the civil <coughs> Again, so sorry, spectrum here. Again, the uh, <laughs> Union troops were in downtown Louisville, so that's how and, and the Confederates place. never got to uh, Louisville. The Confederates, as far as they got, was uh, Frankfurt. So uh, as far as they got was Frankfurt, and the Union was in the city. So they never really attacked these forts. One of the interesting um, heroes of the Civil War was Andrew Cowan. He was from New York. Well, he was originally from Scotland. But uh, he came to New York with his family. And then uh, he joined, uh, when he was 18, 19 years old, the Union Army. He commanded a bat cannon battery, and he was at Gettysburg. In fact, he was right in the midst, in the middle of the uh, Pickett's Charge up the hill there at Gettysburg, and he held his cannon battery together and told them when they saw the whites of their eyes to fire their cannons. So he was credited a lot with helping repel Pickett's Charge uh, that day in July 3rd of 1863. Uh, uh, during the uh, Gettysburg. Uh, after the war, Cowan came to Louisville and settled in Louisville. He moved from New York 
down to Louisville to seek his fame and fortune, and he opened up a uh, leather goods store here where he made belts, boots, saddles, things like that uh, from leather, from the cows and things that they uh, uh, did at the stockyards. And there's actually a marker there in Gettysburg uh, commemorating what Cowan did uh, at Gettysburg. So he was in Louisville. One other person that came to Louisville during the Civil War was John Wilkes Booth. Uh, if you notice, on October 31st, 1862, Booth came to the city to appear in a play here. So why would uh, a, a Confederate sympathizer uh, come to Louisville? Notice it was right after the Battle of Perryville. A lot of people have speculated that he actually was here to scout out the Union troops as a spy for the Confederates. And uh, unfortunately his name will live on in infamy mm -hmm. of what he would later do. But he was here in the city to appear at several of the uh, theaters. Also uh, that came through Louisville was uh, Ulysses Grant and uh, William Sherman. Uh, they came, in fact, Sherman was based in Louisville in the early 1860s, uh, and Grant came through Louisville on numerous occasions. One of them was in uh, 1864 when they came through uh, on a steamboat, and it was said that they helped plan the march to the sea, the, uh, the march through Atlanta in Louisville, but that's really more of a misnomer. They didn't spend much time here in Louisville, so there's no way they could have planned a, a major battle. In fact, other uh, hotels like the, Bur the Burnett House in Cincinnati also claim that the march through the sea was a plan there. The Galt House claims that there's like 20 other hotels and <laughs> locations that claim uh, Grant and Sherman uh, planned the march through the sea there. But they both were here and they both uh, had various rooms here in Louisville. So we do have that connection. So, uh, hello. hello. So after the war, after uh, 1860s, uh, uh, mid 1860, about 1865, we had the DuPont family here. A lot of you have heard of the DuPont Corporation, but the, these uh, two two DuPonts, Antoine Biederman DuPont and Alfred DuPont, uh, came to Louisville in the uh, late 1850s, also to seek their fame and fortune. They were grandsons of uh, E.I. Numerus, if I can get that French word out, uh, DuPont. They were grandsons of the famous DuPont person that started the uh, gunpowder company. And they knew they would never get into the leadership of DuPont, so instead of staying in Wilmington, Delaware, they came to Louisville to seek their fame and fortune. So again, uh, Biederman and Alfred were grandsons of the founder of DuPont. And when they got to Louisville, and they got involved in all sorts of different enterprises, and one of them was streetcars. They bought a one-mule streetcar, like you see in the upper left-hand corner there. Um, they bought a streetcar line that ran from downtown Louisville out to Central Park in the old Louisville neighborhood, sort of they went from downtown out to Central Park area. And from that one-mule streetcar, they made a vast network of streetcars. Um, they owned uh, streetcar lines uh, up in Ohio, uh, in uh, Missouri, as far south as New Orleans. Uh, they had a number of uh, streetcar lines around the country. And they also helped electrify streetcars. So they went from mules to electrification. So the DuPonts were very entrepreneurs and engineers. By the way, you see a one-mule car and a two-mule car there. Whenever you see a two-mule car, that was used on uh, streets that had big hills, so they could go up the hill with two mule cars. A uh, one-mule car was just used for very flat areas. Those four mules. Yeah, those four mules. <laughs> but fortunately, they, they soon got rid of the mules and they went to electrification because uh, they, they felt that was the way to go. Not only that, uh, going to electrification, but they also got rid of, they used to have two people on a streetcar to operate it. Then they went to one, they perfected the fare box so that one, the uh, one conductor could be used on a streetcar. So they were very uh, innovative 
with streetcar technology, the DuPonts were. Then, in the uh, early 1900s, the uh, Wilmington DuPonts, that had the DuPont company, contacted their Louisville DuPonts and said, hey, we're getting ready to sell the company, what do y'all think about that? And the Louisville DuPonts said, no you don't, we're coming back to Wilmington to save the company. And so Thomas Coleman DuPont here, who was born in Louisville in 1863, to Antoine and his uh, mother Ellen DuPont there, uh, they moved all back to uh, Wilmington, Delaware. Here's, here's the uh, family clan here. Biederman DuPont is right here. Uh, Coleman DuPont and the DuPont family. They all moved back to Wilmington and they diversified the DuPont Corporation. Instead of just being in gunpowder, they got them into chemicals and all sorts of other enterprises and it transformed the company into what we know it today. So if it wasn't for the Louisville DuPonts and the entrepreneurial uh, innovative spirit that they had, the DuPont Corporation most likely would not exist today. <clears throat> we still have remnants of DuPont here in Louisville. We have DuPont Manual Training uh, School, which is now DuPont High School. The reason why the DuPonts uh, built that school was for their streetcars. They knew they needed to have technicians and engineers to work on their streetcars, and so they gave the money to build DuPont Manual High School. Then, um, of course, we have the DuPont plant over in West Louisville that's still there. <coughs> and a number of the DuPonts are buried in Cave Hill Cemetery. So the question is, why would DuPonts, once they went back to Wilmington, come back to Louisville to be buried? Why would they have done that? The reason why? They married Louisville women. <laughs> Ellen Coleman DuPont was from Louisville. And all of them had married Louisville women, and the women tend to decide where the men get buried. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's the reason why we have a lot of DuPonts buried in Cave Hill Cemetery. We also had Thomas Edison here. Ten years after he lived here was really his innovative period and did a lot of great things. Boy, can you imagine what Louisville would be if we had Thomas Edison mm -hmm. uh, base here? Uh, 1968, or 1868, sorry. Courier Journal form. Um, Halderman uh, owned the Courier newspaper and George Prentice owned the Journal newspaper. They merged. That's why you always see a hyphen in Courier oh, Journal. I didn't know that. <coughs> that's the how they merged back uh, over 100 years ago. It was a 100 and uh, trying to do the math there. 64 years, 65 years maybe ago. Continuing our chronological uh, advance here in Louisville history, 1871, City Hall was built and it's still being used uh, as a government building. We've not demolished this one yet. <laughs> um, first Kentucky Derby, May 17th, 1875. It was originally known as the Louisville Jockey Club and most of the early jockeys were African American. They were black. <clears throat> the uh, original clubhouse was on the east side of the track. Why did they move the clubhouse to the west side of the track? Because of the sun. Uh -huh. On the east side, as the sun's going down, it blocked their vision as to who might have won the race. So they moved the clubhouse to the west side so the sun was not a factor uh, in the observation of the race. <clears throat> We're getting ready to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Kentucky Derby later this year, uh, in 2024. Um, in the 1890s, um, the track was in dire need. It was going bankrupt. And that's when the, uh, the uh, folks who uh, bought out Churchill Downs brought in Matt Wynn and Sam Culberson to operate the track. And they transformed it into what we know today with the garland and roses, the trophy, the fashion, the hats and all that. Um, so that's who transformed it from the uh, 1800s into today. Continuing our advance, our water supply continued to get better. 1879, they built the reservoir, which still operates today, still gives us clean water from the Ohio River. Filtration plant. 
We are constantly rated very high on our public drinking order here. Um, Mid 1880s, uh, Louisville Slaughter was born. Um, folklore has it that Lewis Rogers Pete Browning cracked a bat one day and uh, John Bud Hillary went up to him after the game and said, hey, I can make you a bat that won't break. And Hillary, Hillary Bradsby was formed after that Louisville Slugger. However, Frank Bradsby, who, whose name is also on the company, he wrote a memoir that gave another version of that story. According to uh, Bradsby, Lewis Rogers Pete Burling didn't break a bat. He actually came to the factory and ordered uh, the bat to be made. So I'll let you decide if you, which version of the story <laughs> that you like about how Louisville Slugger was uh, formed. And I have a feeling Frank Bradsby had an inside knowledge there of how that happened. Uh, bridging the Ohio River was always very important and uh, one of the first vehicle bridges was the K uh, Kentucky and Indiana Bridge, the K&I Bridge in 1886. It allowed uh, covered wagons and wagons and horse-drawn vehicles to come across the river in 1886. Then in 1912, that bridge was totally, totally rebuilt to allow heavier trains and automobiles. So it had to be uh, structurally improved for automobiles to run on it. Currently today, the uh, K&I Bridge still exists, but it no longer has uh, car traffic on it. Uh, it just allows uh, railroad traffic. Hopefully someday we can open the uh, K&I back up to at least bicycle and pedestrian use. That's what we would like to have, see happen. Here's an 1884 map of Louisville. So we're up into the 1880s, mid-1880s of how Louisville was growing back then. And notice this one little dark area right there. That was the Southern Exposition. 1883 to 1887, and this was a very big deal, sort of like a, a World's Fair, uh, but it was mainly an agricultural um, exposition. Louisville was trying to position itself to help reconstruct the South after the Civil War, so they did this huge exposition that highlighted all the manufacturing uh, technology that the city had, such as tractors and plows and any agricultural related equipment that they were doing. They also did um, uh, artwork and other things, but it was mainly manufacturing to help the South recover from the Civil War. Um, here's a map of the Southern Exposition. The building itself was massive. It occupied several uh, city blocks in the old Louisville area. But really, the building was only one-third of the exposition. The other two-thirds were gardens and landscape-oriented um, exposition, botanical displays. And we'll discuss that a little bit later, and I'll explain how that transpired into the next phase of Louisville. Here's some images from the Chicago World, oh, not Chicago, but Louisville's exposition, very similar to the Chicago World's Fair, but Southern Exposition. Just a massive thing. It only it was uh, the building was built, I think, in nine months. Very fast. They built this huge thing, but it was only the last one year. It was not supposed to last four years, like it eventually did. But it was so successful. A lot of folks there. Here's a view of uh, downtown Louisville in 1889. Pretty much everything that you see there no longer exists. That's what it looks like today. Wow. So here's the courthouse right here. Here's that courthouse view looking that way. And that's what you see today. Hmm. Kind of a little bit of a change in the last hundred and what, 34 years. Um, so, as I was mentioning earlier, um, two-thirds of the Southern Exposition dealt with landscape, horticultural, and uh, botanical displays. And that got the city think fathers thinking, like, huh, people really liked all that landscape, so what, why don't we uh, start building some more parks here in the city? 
So, in 1891, they invited Frederick Law Olmsted to come to Louisville, right there, Frederick Law Olmsted. I mentioned earlier about Andrew Cowan, he was one of the leaders, and a guy by the name of Thomas Speed. They all came together to push this idea of creating parks for Louisville. One of the reasons why, as well, was our population. Our population kept going from like 12th to 14th to 16th to 20th. We were not keeping pace uh, population-wise with the other cities in the uh, United States that we were competing with. So the uh, city leaders thought that by building these parks, it would bring a lot more people into Louisville to help with the manufacturing plants and all that. So it was, it was a grand scheme of what they were looking at doing, and that's why they brought in Frederick Law Olmsted. Uh, 1887, here's an original map of what they were, the parks they were looking at. They were looking at an east, west, and a south park uh, for this. One other person that really helped facilitate the parks was Mayor Charles Jacob. He was an extremely wealthy person. He didn't care what other people thought. He, he loved the idea of the parks, even though the city council did not. In fact, a lot of people thought he was not not correct. He was sort of crazy with all these parks that he was proposing, but uh, Jacob, being independently wealthy, used his own money to help buy some of the land for these parks, such wow. as Iroquois Park. Just like today, if our mayor would go out to, say, Odom County or Bullitt County and buy land for a park using his own money, we as citizens of Louisville would say, what are you doing? That doesn't make sense. But anyways, uh, Jacob loved the idea thought it could work, and uh, made it happen. One other person that uh, I do want to give credit for the parks was uh, John Castleman. He was sort of the project manager for the park system. He would ride his horse Caroline around to the various parks, making sure that progress was being made and they were adhering to Olmsted's uh, design. So the question now is, okay, they did all these parks, was it a, was it a success? Did it result in increased population? Well, not exactly. So if you notice, 1900 is when the parks were being built. Then by 1910, we were 24th, 29th, uh, 30th. And by uh, the end of the 1900s, we were 64th. So it really did not produce the population increase that the city fathers had envisioned with the park system. But what it did do was spur a residential development and, and more importantly, tax revenues. A lot of wealthy Louisvillians built their homes around these parks and it raised the property values around in that area, which resulted in more tax revenue. Today we call that tax increment financing. I won't get into the weeds of this, but we're still using the same concept today to build things, about how we put in a put in some uh, a nice improvement that spurs property values to going up. So we built a lot of nice residences. They also built uh, some nice uh, artwork, even Yando, Hogan's Fountain, and other nice designs within the park system. One other, I also credit bringing Ford Motor Company to Louisville for the park system. Because if you look at our map here, that red star right there, it's right in the center of where all these parks come together. Eastern Parkway, Southern Parkway, Algonquin Parkway, uh, Shawnee, Cherokee, Iroquois, they all meet right there in the center, and that's where Ford Motor Company put their first plant back in 1913. A little bit later on, when Ford decided building cars vertically was not the best idea, they started building them horizontally, they built another plant out on Southwestern Parkway in 1925 for horizontal building of the, of the uh, trucks and cars. And we still here at Louisville today have a huge Ford Motor Company plants out on Fern Valley Road and out on uh, off of Westport Road. So uh, I credit Ford coming here because of uh, our park system. So it did have that success. So in the uh, late 1890s, early 1900s, uh, the city started expanding more southward. We had the old Louisville area being built. 
in which again we had a lot of beautiful homes uh, being constructed around Central Park there. The, the Ferguson Mansion, this one in the upper right hand corner, was the most expensive house built in Kentucky. I think it was in those days it was around a million dollars, which uh, was astronomical. It's still a beautiful uh, building. The Filson Historical Society owns it today. But all these homes in the old Louisville area were just phenomenal. And one reason why these wealthy built these homes in this area was due to the, uh, uh, their factories were just to the west of old Louisville along the Ellenian Railroad. St. James Court area was also developed at this time. And here are all the factories. So all those wealthy uh, elite folks who lived in these mansions in old Louisville, all of their factories were pretty much just to the west of Old Louisville along the Ellington Railroad lines. One other person I want to mention about this time was uh, Susan Luke Avery. Um, she was the uh, wife of Benjamin Avery, who, when he died in 1887, was the wealthiest Louisvillian at that time. And then after he passed away, Susan took inherited his money, I don't want to say took, but inherited his money, and she helped fund the women's right to vote, the suffrage, suffragette movement, uh, with Susan B. Anthony. And so we give credit to Susan Avery for helping fund Susan B. Anthony's uh, right to vote for the women, and they did numerous markers in the last couple of years to recognize her for that. One of the major changes in Louisville in the past hundred some odd years, was happened on October 4th, 1898. That's when the first automobile rolled onto the streets of Louisville. It was an electric car, believe it or not. It was battery operated. It was made up in Indianapolis. The guy that owned the Louisville Carriage Company bought it, picked it up, and he shipped it down by rail from Indianapolis, and then he drove it about, about the city streets. Can you imagine what pandemonium uh, <laughs> happened when he's out driving around the horse in front. So that was in 1898 when the first one arrived. Just 10 years later, we had 400 automobiles in Louisville. Yeah, great increase. So all the wealthy who could afford these contraptions purchased them. And what did they do once they got their car? They decided to move out. Instead of living in that old Louisville area, they abandoned those mansions and moved out to the east, south, and west. Uh, 1890 tornado uh, was a very destructive uh, <coughs> event in Louisville history. Uh, it swept in from the southwest portion of the city, actually went through downtown Louisville, devast devastated the West Main District area, went across the Ohio River, and then came back across the river and it demolished our uh, water tower there at uh, River Road and uh, Zorn Avenue. And a few years ago, they put up this uh, sculpture of the 1890 tornado as commemorative to it, but very uh, dramatic <coughs> event. <coughs> we also, in the late 1890s, had the Happy Birthday song by the Hill Sisters, Mildred and Patty. Patty was a um, kindergarten teacher, or as I've been reprimanded many times, she was an early childhood educator. And then uh, Mildred was the musician of the family. And together they wrote numerous early childhood educator songs. One of them was called Morning to You, which they adapted to Happy Birthday to You. And the Songwriters Hall of Fame says it's probably the most sung song in the history of music. Every day, people sing that song mm -hmm. hundreds of times. I'll never forget, I was in Italy one time, in Rome, and they were singing it in Italian on the table next to me. Made me feel like home. Hey, there's a Louisville song. Enid <laughs> <laughs> um, Yandel was very active uh, at this period. She was a sculptress of Louisville. Did a lot of the statuary at the Chicago World's Fair. She studied with Augusta Rodin over in uh, uh, Paris, France. She did sculptures throughout the, the area. Daniel Boone, Hogan's Fountain. 
some uh, significant buildings that were built during this time, the Silbach, the train station, uh, the Lincoln, Washington skyscraper, and the U.S. Customs Building. The old jail was built also at that time, still standing. Nowadays, we put all of our city officials in the jail. <laughs> uh, we have another jail for, for the prisoners. <laughs> I think it's all the county attorneys are in the jail right now, old jail. Uh, I always want to credit some of uh, my architectural brethren, uh, Charles Clark and Arthur Loomis. They built some of the more distinctive buildings in Louisville. Carter Dry Goods, which is now the Science Center, Levy Brothers, which is now Old Spaghetti Factory, Conrad Caldwell House, J.B. Speed Art Museum, the library buildings, signature buildings for the city. Also want to give credit to Louis Brandeis, 1856-1941. Uh, he was one of the more uh, distinguished uh, uh, justices of the Supreme Court. He was born, not so much born, I think he uh, lived here at this one building on East Broadway. It was his boyhood home. Not exactly sure where, which home exactly he was bought, um, born in, but th this one is still existing. If you ever get to the Supreme Court, I'm not sure if anyone here has been there, but uh, if you go to the Supreme Court, there's a lot of um, plaques talking about the history of the court, and many of them reference uh, Louis Brandeis from Louisville, uh, he uh, had a major impact on the court and still does to this day. In fact, you'll be reading about some Supreme Court decision and I'll talk about Brandeis's view of that same topic. That upper left-hand corner photo uh, or painting of him making him look like a mad scientist, if you will. But um, anyways, yeah, he's a uh, very distinguished justice of the Supreme Court. And our U of L School of Law was named for him. And him and his wife, Alice, are buried just to the right of the entrance to the uh, School of Law. They were both cremated in their ashes placed uh, adjacent to the entrance right there. Uh, then uh, we're in the mid uh, early 1900s, uh, 1915, 1916 era. That's when World War I uh, was ramping up. And uh, here in Louisville, we had Camp Zachary Teller, which had thousands of uh, uh, soldiers trained here. In fact, it says 125,000 soldiers were trained here. Can you imagine that many soldiers here in Louisville? And uh, them all being trained. There are some uh, images of what the camp looked like back 100 some odd years ago. And Camp Zachary Teller, now when, today when we think of Camp Teller neighborhood, it's a very confined district over there off Popco Level and Waterson Expressway. But in fact, it stretched far and wide. It went all the way from Preston Highway, all the way over to Newburgh Road, and then as far north as uh, a Clark Boulevard or Eastern Parkway area all the way past uh, the Waterson Expressway. It was a massive acreage of land that Camp Teller had. And this uh, one uh, yellow area here, which is way south of the camp, that was their firing range. That's where they had people who have live fire with guns and all that. They obviously did not want to do that up where the soldiers were stationed, but that's out in Oklahoma district is where they had their uh, live fire drills. So here's kind of a uh, map of how massive uh, Camp Teller was, very large area. This is sort of the same map. It would include the Louisville Zoo, would include Olive and Park area, all the way up to where, um, over on Newburgh Road. It was large area, Camp Teller. Here's some uh, comparative images of it. Poplar Level Road, and this is the same curve. Pretty much all, most of the buildings have long since been demolished and replaced. I think there are a couple of barracks buildings which still exist that are now apartments, but for the most part, 95, 99% of the buildings are now gone. 
there used to be a huge building over at the parks that housed where they had all of their military uh, artillery, like tanks and things like that. They were stored over a Trevilian Way area, but they demolished that huge barn a few years ago. Here are some more images of, of what the camp looked like versus what it is today. However, what Camp Teller today is remembered for was the major flu epidemic that swept through the camp. Back, similar to what we just recently experienced with COVID, uh, the uh, uh, U.S. as well as around the world had a major flu, it's called the Spanish flu epidemic. 1,500 men uh, died at Camp Teller due to that epidemic. And you can see 3% of the world's population died, 50 million people out of that disease. I think COVID was around 1%, I want to say. It was, I don't think it got to 2%. Can you imagine 3% a death rate from all that? <coughs> they were saying, uh, what, 43,000 soldiers? About half of those that were killed in combat, um, more than 43,000 were killed due to the flu. Uh, they had the, uh, uh, sister, the Ursuline sisters, the nuns, the Catholic nuns, uh, served... Uh, at Camp Teller and helped treat a lot of the soldiers that had the flu and unfortunately a number of them died of the flu as well when they contracted it. Here was a, um, the Ursulines put out this uh, history on them not too long ago talking about a number of the nuns that were stationed at Camp Teller. This nun here uh, said she contracted the flu while there, although she lived 18, well, she was 100 years old, 1893 to 1983. But anyways, the Ursuline sisters helped control the, uh, the flu there at Camp Taylor. One other uh, historical note that came out of Camp Taylor was the great Gadsby. F. Scott Fitzgerald, the great American novelist, was stationed at Camp Taylor. And um, when he wrote his novel, The Great Gatsby, he used a lot of uh, Louisville locations as references in the book, although he renamed them at, for various uh, reasons. For instance, uh, he, the Silbach Hotel, it was known as the Muehlbach Hotel in his book. And uh, Daisy, who was uh, uh, the, the love interest in the book, uh, her house, Evidently was this one here on in Cherokee Triangle, the Emma Moore House. Emma Moore had a lot of parties and dances for the soldiers at Camp Teller, and thus it is believed that F. Scott Fitzgerald would attend some of these parties and use that house as a reference for Daisy within the uh, the book. A few other uh, items in the late. Er, 1918, 1919 uh, thing is when uh, Robert Worth Bingham uh, purchased the uh, Courier Journal and then created his media empire with radio and TV and all. Uh, Henry Watterson was the editor of the Courier Journal at that time, and the story is that he and Bingham did not get along very well, and that's when uh, Watterson retired as the publisher shortly thereafter Bingham's purchase. We still remember. Uh, Waterson to this day by the expressway that is named for him. Why we would name an expressway for Henry Waterson is beyond me. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that would have occurred. He, he passed away, I think, in the 1920s, I want to say, Waterson did. So uh, I'm not sure why uh, we would name it after a newspaper publisher. Mm -hmm. See, uh, Simmons University was founded about this time also major African-American university in, in the heart of Louisville. It's here, uh, Seventh in Kentucky is its location. It still exists today. And then, uh, one major date that will live in infamy in Kentucky is <laughs> January 17, 1920, Prohibition, George Garvin Brown, and uh, Fran Foreman, which uh, Garvin Brown founded, and it survived Prohibition, 
<coughs> by saying that the whiskey that they manufactured was actually medicine, <laughs> you know, and not actually bourbon as such. And I have done some recent uh, research on the Brown family, and what it was, I, George Garvin Brown, where he came up with this whole concept, was he actually was a salesman for a um, whiskey company that sold the whiskey to doctors to use for anesthesia back in those days. They did not have the modern an anesthesia that we have today. They literally got people drunk to be able to perform surgery on them back in those days. And so George Gorgon Brown, when he was selling the, this whiskey to these doctors, the doctors would complain that some whiskey was great, that the patients would get drunk, go out, and other whiskey was not so great. And it's not very good if you're operating on someone that is not totally out, if you will. <laughs> and so Garvin Brown got this idea is, gosh, how can we control the quality of whiskey? That's when he came up with the concept of putting it in bottles, that the good quality of whiskey was in bottles. And uh, so that's how Brown Foreman got its name and all that and moved forward from there. And then, uh, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s is when they started developing regulations for the quality of bourbon and all, but uh, then George Garvin Brown had built up a great clientele uh, selling quality bourbon in bottles. Prior to that, they would just sell it in barrels, and they would literally dip it out of the barrels, but Brown put it into bottles. So that's prohibition. We also have movie theaters came into the city about that time. We had some great motion pictures. And uh, WHAS Radio, 1922. Probably it's 101 years old now. Can you imagine? Wow. Technology has changed a lot. Nowadays, it's still listening on the radio, we can listen to it on our cell phones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One other thing, 1923 is when Bowman Field came about. Here's an early uh, image of it here, 1919. It was once owned by the Caldwell family, but it was uh, um, taken over by the U.S. government. And uh, then uh, Abraham uh, Bowman came along and uh, created the, the airfield. Here's Bowman Field. Last but not least, uh, we're going to talk a little bit how U of L came about. Um, there was this thing called the House of Refuge, which was way out on the outskirts of Louisville. It was way on the suburbs. Nowadays, U of L is sort of towards the inner city, but back in uh, uh, the early 1900s, it was way out uh, in farmland. And they had the House of Refuge there, which was primarily sort of a large orphanage. It was for um, uh, adolescents who needed more supervision, training, things of this nature is more of an orphanage and a disciplinary area. And so they had this campus there for kids that need a little bit more education, if you will. So they, they would ship them out to this area. And then as the uh, city continued to grow, the House of Refuge uh, moved out from this campus moved out to what was called Ormsby Village and several other um, uh, institutions farther out in the suburbs of Louisville. So when the House of Refuge left this campus and moved out, that's when U of L purchased it in the early 1920s to create their campus. And a number of the buildings from the House of Refuge still exist on the U of L campus that they use as classroom buildings even today. Why is it called the Belknap Campus? It's because of William Richardson Belknap. He was the uh, son of the uh, yeah, son of the founder, uh, William Burke Belknap, upper left-hand corner of the hardware company. When William Richardson Belknap died, he left in his will that some of the money be used for educational purposes, and that's when they uh, purchased the campus at U of L, renamed it the Belknap Campus. And then uh, they also built this school over in the uh, Belknap neighborhood, uh, over there at uh, Trevilian and Bardstown Road area. 
So uh, William Richardson Belknap's money still lives on today. And we, they still call it the Belknap campus, which primarily there's only one major campus of U of L. Mm -hmm. So anyways, but that's how it got its name and that's how U of L got their campus from the House of Refuge to the Belknap family. And there's the skyline of Louisville in 1923. So we've come a long ways from just being uh, Falls of the Ohio uh, all the way up to today. So uh, part three, we're going to, so we just covered 60 years of Louisville history from 1862 to 1923. It's about 60 years. Our ne my next uh, presentation in part three is going to cover 100 years from 1923 up to 2023. We'll do that in January. Any questions on that? When are you going to get started on this book? Uh, <laughs> in fact, you, you brought up a good point. I, I have a little Christmas gift for y'all at the end of this. And I'll be passing that out here shortly. Any other questions? Yeah, I was curious yeah. about Fort Duffield. About, okay, yeah. Because uh, I've been to it, but yeah. I didn't know how important that was to the scheme of mobile or not. That was on the, the western area. That was over in the, what, the West Point area? Yeah, West Point. Point yeah, it was uh, another earthen style okay. fort, and uh, yeah, it was on the uh, western perimeter, and that was strategic because of the Ohio River, right adjacent mm -hmm. to the Ohio River. But again, Louisville was never threatened. It, there were several times in which Confederates got close to Louisville and created a panic for the residents, but never actually entered into the city. But yeah, Fort D D D Duffield on the western uh, edge of the what, what, Jefferson County, Meade County, is yeah, it? Or, uh, yeah, I think so. I think it's Meade County that's right there on the edge of that Salt River area. Yeah, it's, it's neat. you got to yeah. take a car or bus that takes you up. It's like, the way, I mean, you're I, I, laying I, back. I know where it's at, but I've never been to oh, it. Oh, so. I highly recommend it. Just the bus ride up is worth it. Oh, you're literally yeah. laying back because 